Welcome, everybody, and happy Veterans Day. Uh, you know, uh, veterans make a really important part of the Owen community, and um, I think this year's class, I think we have the most veterans we've ever had in a single class, the incoming class, uh, which is really fantastic, uh, an important part of the Owen community, and it's uh, really a delight uh, to be able to uh, celebrate Veterans Day and um, to be able to celebrate and have uh, General Hickman here today. Uh, General Hickman's a 92 alum, and uh, we didn't talk about this yet, General, but we overlapped by a year. I came uh, to Owen in the fall of 91, um, but I taught just first year classes that year, so we would have never connected in the classroom, right. but we overlapped a year and probably stood out in the <laughs> courtyard and had a beer or two, uh, what was then called uh, kegs in the courtyard. Uh, uh, now has the, evolved into something, you know, uh, I would say more refined. We call it closing bell. And, and we have more than beer. But yeah. this year we have nothing. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's a sad thing, right? You know, it's unbelievable uh, that we have to suffer through this pandemic without closing bell. But that's just the way it is, right? Um, but uh, uh, General Hickman also um, uh, has an undergraduate degree from Vandy. And at a time when Vandy had an undergraduate business degree. Yes. Um, which is kind of a, a, another interesting little uh, bit of Vanderbilt history. There was a, a period of time that Vanderbilt had an undergraduate business degree, and then uh, that in, got shut down for various and sundry reasons. There's lots of folklore about that. I, I've never completely convinced myself I understand the truth of it all, but um, the, the undergraduate degree ended sometime in the... Mm, I would say mid 80s, somewhere right. in there, it, it kind of disappeared. And it was kind of the time when Owen was growing up and, and uh, becoming uh, you know, a much stronger school. So people sometimes blame it on Owen that Vanderbilt doesn't have an undergraduate business degree. I will say we've kind of brought it back. We have now an undergraduate business minor that we just launched four years ago, hugely popular. There's a thousand undergraduate students taking our courses this fall, just in the That's minor, great. it's really, yeah really spectacular. Um, but this school right here and, and this library and so forth, it's still pretty much just graduate students. That's what we're focused on day in and day out. And um, uh, leaving uh, Vanderbilt for the first time, uh, uh, General Hickman joined the Army. And um, I think he could tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to dig into a little bit more about that history as we uh, go along. But, um, you know, he's had a really a spectacular career, uh, 36 years of leadership experience. And one of the things that I find just really amazing about our military uh, friends and our alum and, and our current students, it's just the size of organizations they often end up running, right? You know, I mean, uh, at one time, Bill had oversight for 10,000 military and civilian personnel and their families. I mean, you're running a city at that point. It you're was. A, you're a mayor of a city. It, and was, it was really a city. It is, one of these installations is basically a city. Wow. With all the things that come along with that, I'm yeah, sure. Right. right? Um, and, um, you know, experience in uh, Middle East theater during those times and um, just a spectacular set of, of management experiences. And that's what we're going to dig into a little bit today, uh, talk about uh, crisis management and some of the challenges uh, that we all face, but things that uh, General Hickman uh, learned from his time uh, in the military. Right. And I, I, I thought I'd start off before we get into the crisis management stuff, I'd love to have you tell us about that piece from undergraduate to Owen, because uh, you graduated in, 80, in 83. 83. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, and then came back eight years later or right. something like that. So tell us about that piece and then uh, a, a little bit post Owen. Just give us kind of okay. the... Okay, well, I, in 83 we did. We were commissioned on uh, May 13th. I still remember the day, 1983, the uh, graduation and the commissioning ceremony. And the next day I went to Fort Benning. Uh, you had a job. There was no job hunting. Next day. And uh, that's, that was a Friday, a Saturday morning. I was it's about Saturday afternoon. I was at Fort Benning, Georgia for infantry training. And that, that went on uh, for infantry, infantry training, ranger school, and all the, the, the standard schools that the infantry officer takes. And then I went to uh, the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and really learned, uh, what you learned there is uh, readiness. So we did several exercises and, and different things there. And I did that to 1986, and then I, I, we, the battalion I was in, the, the, the group of men, about uh, 500 of us, 
got an opportunity to uh, rotate to Italy. I was stationed in Vicenza, Italy with an airborne battalion there. And the big focus in that was uh, connection to NATO. You know, the Cold War was still going on in the 80s. And so we did exercises in eastern Turkey and other, other parts of Turkey and northern Italy to demonstrate uh, the U.S., but NATO's resolve to defend the southern yeah. flank of NATO. The, these NATO countries could deploy anywhere uh, to defend NATO. So it was really a very exciting time. And I finished the command there. I had about 150 soldiers in my last job. The commanded led those, those exercises. And the Army asked, I said, what do you want to do next? They offered me a couple of jobs I will go over, but they didn't sound very exciting to me. And they said, well, you can go get an uh, MBA if you want. Uh, I said, good, I'll, I'll get an MBA if I can go. And uh, they said, but you have to get a, you have to apply. Obviously, you have to get it. As I, said, I told my parents I wasn't married at the time, but my wife's here with me. I, I said, I'm going to come back. I'm going to go to Owen or go to another job in the Army. I'm not going to go to get an MBA anywhere else. So I applied, and luckily I was accepted and got to spend two years here. We had a great time. And that's almost coming home for you because you my, my grew up from, just down the road. And yeah, I, I'd spent four years in Italy uh, away from home, and I uh, figured, well, I might as well come back to Tennessee. And my family's from Columbia, which is about an hour south of here, and we had a great time. And, and, uh, and, and, and we, I, I do enjoy the basketball games, the football games, even though uh, we, it come, ebb and flows here at Vanderbilt. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we had some, for, good, I, some good years and bad years. But I don't we had remember a great the, time. the fall of 91 being a particularly good no, football no, year. No, <laughs> no. The early 90s were bad. Uh, 1982, <laughs> when I was a senior, we did, we did yeah. do, we went to bowl game. My years are very exciting. So, yeah. so you just got to hit it at the right time. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And then post and back to the military. Yeah, back to the military. I did a couple of uh, jobs. Uh, uh, really, I had to, I had to, my payback to the Army was work uh, some uh, research and development type jobs, uh, developing new equipment for the Army, uh, at the, at a, for the infantry. But anyway, that's what I basically did. But I had a chance to leave that and go serve in the Ranger Regiment. And so I did that uh, with the 75th Ranger Regiment. And then, and then my career brought me to Fort Campbell four times. And so I had a, a great time serving with the Fort Campbell. By the now, the wars are going on and multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and so it was, uh, it's exciting times, but I treasure the time for Owen, to, uh, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but really the, the chance to get out of the Army comfort zone into another uh, culture and really learn a lot from that was really exciting. Well, we, we wanted to spend a little time just talking about crisis management, because yeah. certainly uh, you had your share of crises to yeah. deal with managing towns of, 10,000 military yeah. Yeah. Uh, folks. Um, well, if I could just, uh, if I could just pre you know, appreciate the invitation here. Thanks. Yeah. It is Veterans Day. It's a special day to be here. And my wife, Mamie's here with me. I'm glad she was able to come down with me from Murfreesboro tonight. She's, she graduated from Owen, or not from Owen, from the nursing school. Got her master's here from, in nursing from uh, Vanderbilt, which is fantastic. And so we have a, we both really love this university. More than one Owen nursing couple over the years. Yeah. <laughs> so it is special to be here today. What I, would, what I was hoping to spend about five minutes kind of introduce crisis management and, some, and really give a couple of examples. You know, you have a crisis. The best, best thing to do, people ask me what to do with a crisis, is don't have it. Prevent the crisis. And so I'm going to talk about that for a few minutes. But the crisis come, and then what do you do at the end of this thing? And it, it's very exciting. I think I'm going to be a little uh, challenging and, and provocative here over the couple of examples I have. It is Veterans Day, but I'm going to talk about problems, not about uh, how, how we did everything great. Because... We did a lot of great things, but I think we need to focus on a couple of problems here. So I'm going to, have, uh, so I'm going to talk that way, pre-crisis, crisis, post-crisis, post but I'm going to start in the middle of crisis in my story. And I'm going to give three examples, if I can. Quick, quick short examples, but where crisis has occurred. You know, in um, October 2015, uh, I was stationed in Kuwait, uh, and I got a call. The, the U.S. military, the U.S. Army, there's a big crisis in Kanduz, uh, Afghanistan, that's a northern province. A lot of hard fighting was going on. And uh, one night, the U.S. Army soldiers on the ground called in a, uh, the U.S. Air Force, an AC-130. AC it's an aircraft that, that fires very accurate fires to support the Army. And they ended up bombing a hospital, which is, this is a crisis occurring here. And so I was asked to go in and lead the investigation team. There's about 30 of us, uh, myself and two one-star generals and experts from all the, all the services. We spent 30 days walking the whole ground. And what we found out is the, uh, what, what, what you learn from this when, uh, when you bomb a hospital for 27 minutes, but the soldiers didn't realize they were directing fires in the hospital. No, no American soldiers are going to do that. The Air Force didn't realize they were shooting a hospital, but they were shooting a hospital and killed 40 people. And what you learn from this is uh, 
you know, there's poor planning, there's poor senior leader uh, leadership, complacency was going on. The aircraft crew, crew was not cohesive. Uh, we found out there were training deficiencies. The enemy did have a vote that night. They did things that uh, caused confusing and friction. Uh, we had intelligence failures, technology failures, uh, other type of failures that occurred that uh, set up this terrible uh, incident, this tragic incident to occur. It happened in multiple layers of command, from four star, two star, colonels, lieutenant colonels, these are levels of command, as you can imagine, from the highest level in Afghanistan all the way down to the lowest level, uh, where you had major failures going on. But what, what, you, what you learn in this is, um, it's not the second that the aircraft is firing. These, these failures started months, uh, weeks, days, hours, and seconds before the rounds were fired. And that, that's very important. Crisis, I'm talking, these are the type of crises I'm talking about, not COVID or, or, or a hurricane or a tornado. Sure. The, uh, that's one example. So I want to give two other examples. Uh, and, and the second one, I was in Mosul, Mosul, Iraq in 2003. We had two helicopters collide midair, and I was part of the operations section of our unit, so I was deeply involved in this. But if you go back and look at it, you know, there was a failures in leadership, there was a failures in understanding the environment changing, there was a failure in understanding airspace management. I mean, there were several failures that occurred over time, and this is, these are tragic instances. There's, that's why I'm bringing them up, trying to be challenging and provocative here. And when this occurs, you, uh, you don't, do helicopters just don't crash into each other in the middle of uh, the airspace in, in a military operation. It takes months, weeks, days, hours, minutes, and seconds before those two helicopters crash. The angle of attack sensor was bad, but there were training bad, maintenance was bad. It took, uh, there were eight, a total of 89 factors that were failed. 89 different things failed to get that airplane to crash and kill 189 people. And it was Boeing and it was um, the FFAA. There was a maintenance facility in the United States. Pilot training, the liner itself had problems. The pilots who fl flew the plane the day before had problems with that plane and they didn't report it correctly. It took months, weeks, you know, days, hours, and seconds to, for an airplane to crash. It just didn't. It just wasn't didn't just happen. one thing. It wasn't one thing. There's a chain of things you look at. These are crises that go across. We want to prevent a crisis so we can do our mission. Because when crises happen, it just it just that's the focus. You you lose at times focus on your mission because you have to you have to take care of the families. You have to take care of everybody. You need to find out what happened. And so um, we looked at uh, three or four different traits to people how to do this. And really, we looked at. Uh, Courage and character were the first group two to go together. You know, the courage to face adversity, the courage to look for innovative solutions, the courage to stand up for what is right in people. And then the character to be able to have the values to do that were very important. Uh, we looked at vision and guidance. Do you, does the organization have a quality vision that everybody understands? And do the senior leaders use the guidance to communicate that vision in an organization? Do they, can they do that? We also looked around when we did these investigations. That you had to play the hand you're dealt. You know, you can always try to make your hand better, but the resources, the people, the equipment, the mission, you have to be able to play that hand the way it's dealt to you and be able to accomplish the mission and, and prevent a crisis. And then decision-making. Uh, you have to actually practice decision-making. I mean, the Army spends a lot of time in training where the, when you make a bad decision, there's not tragic results. And, uh, and I think there are a lot of time case studies, scenario planning, things like that does that. The second thing I looked at very hard, those are the leadership traits. The second thing we looked hard in organizations is trust. Do they have trust in the organization? And trust is not really hard. It's very easy to measure, actually, if you know what you're looking for. And we looked across organizations, the culture of the organization. Do, do the people, um, do they buy into the vision? Do they understand the vision? Do they support the vision? Do they support the values of the organization? Do they support the leaders and, and they all work together as a team? Do they have the vision? Do they understand the vision? experiences and services, and, and service, selfless service. So, so how do you measure culture to see if it works? And, and you mentioned uh, the installation. One of them I ran was the Joint Raiders Training Center. We had a great team there. And we ran these after action reviews. And if you run an after action review, you can, you can read the culture of that organization in one of these tough after action reviews. I mean, are people very candid in their discussion? Do the senior leaders encourage people to be very honest, upfront, and candid about the, the problems? And then do they volunteer and they're looking for ways to, to make their, their organization better? If you, have a, if you see an or, a discussion going over a couple hours like that and with observers watching, then you know you have an incredible culture, you have incredible trust. And if you don't, then you know you have a problem there. 
So the last point I'll break on this, and then I'll kind of summarize this up and get to the questions, is the, um, you know, what type of leaders do you need to lead these organizations? And so you can train leaders, but there are, there are people called, I, I would call masters of leadership. You know, we have concert pianists. A lot of people can play the piano, but only some people can be concert pianists. The ones that spend thousands and thousands of hours perfecting their skill and their craft. I would say leaders are the same way. There's lots of good leaders out there, but there's only some that are going to spend the hours and hours, the thousands of hours required to be a master at leadership. They have those intangibles, like a concert pianist has. And so those are the people you're looking for to run your organization, to be at the senior levels. And, and then they will help prevent crises. And the ideas we're talking about here, there's four things I think a master person, leadership person has. Number one, they're dreamers. And I read an article that in uh, LinkedIn, somebody wrote, they call it applied curiosity. But you're, you're looking at the future. You're looking, you're, uh, you don't accept the status quo. You're, uh, you have an infinite learning curve. A master of leadership is always looking to learn something new <laughs> every day. But you, you see some, everybody says that, but some people are doing it in every, I'm, I'm learning right now how you learn things. You get your organization to a band of excellence and you don't accept leaving the band of excellence over time, over months and years. If, you're, if your organization dips because the environment changed, then you're, you're really not a master of leadership. You're asking lots of questions, you're gathering information, and you and your team are building new knowledge. That's critical. And then the insights and the patterns. You, you can see insights and patterns. And uh, so that kind of leads me back to the, um, what we just talked about here. What the, the three crises. Yeah. The aircraft, the airliner hit the ground killing 189, 189 people is not a crisis. The destroying of the hospital is not the crisis. The colliding of the two helicopters is not the crisis. The crisis have been going on for months in all those organizations. You just, the indicator that you finally observed was this tragic event. The outcome. The outcome, of, if this tragic event had not occurred, the crisis would have continued because a crisis occur a lot of times, but you don't have a tragic outcome, so a tragic event, so people just continue to doing the same thing over and over again. And so that's kind of the point I wanted to bring out there, and as we go through our discussion is, uh, you know, how do you prevent crisis? It's, it's, it's before the crisis, not after the crisis. We can talk about after the crisis too if we want to, but, but I think that's so critical. You have to have these masters of leaders in your organization that really have these intangibles because they're, and they're really, they're not born with them. They're just people who, just have the drive. They're willing to spend the, spend the tens of thousands of hours to be a leader, where good leaders don't have to spend that much time, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. But, but I think I'll, I'll stop there, because I know we want to kind of get a discussion well, going here. I, you know, I, I, it's really fascinating. You're talking about this chain reaction of events and, and, um, and also knowing that, you know, you're always going to be dealt some hand, right? right. In, in your own teams that you had, were there people that you knew I can put this this person in to a situation that's not perfect. The, 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 maybe they don't have the right culture. Or they don't have. They haven't taken these steps. But but this particular leader is going to be able to go in there and defuse the bomb, as it were. Right? You know, try to 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 right the ship or whatever metaphor we want to use. Right. Right. You you do that, and you you want to learn that as quickly as possible. But you have to do that through difficult through shared difficult experiences. And so the Army had a, uh, there was a very fast uh, up-tempo, fast pace. And especially as we went from 2001 through 2011, it's still fast for some units. Where you would deploy for uh, 12 to 15 months, come home for 12 to 15 months, deploy again. The soldiers were going back and forth to Iraq and Afghanistan. But, you, but then those windows of being back there, you would go through dip, very difficult training experiences. And through shared experiences, you would, you would build trust between each other and really understand the capabilities of each individual. And then you get really you get you get determine who you, who you can sign for what mission, what task. But what were the uh, I guess the features of someone you would put into a situation that you knew was more volatile or? Well, well, they had to be. Uh, they had to, they, number one, they had to understand the vision of the organization, what we were trying to do. There was uh, in Iraq, there were some commanders really understood what, uh, especially when the surge was going on, and Jim Petraeus was there, what we were trying to do. Others would go to these deployments and, and be very lethal. 
which was not the answer. You, wanted, you had to have a, a mix. You had, to be, you had to be strong, but you also had to be understanding. So if they understood the vision of what the organization wants to do, and then to go in one of these crises, they had to be calm. You didn't want somebody, a screamer. You want somebody to go in and can look and provide uh, stability to the, to the situation. You didn't want them to add to the problem. <laughs> and then they needed, and I think the third thing is they needed to know who to reach back to. So you go into these uh, organizations, these crises, and they could uh, help determine what the choices are, the options to fix the, fix the problem. And then, but they can reach back for help from other, uh, and not be afraid to ask for help. And I think if you got those three, those three characteristics of an individual, you put them in there with the team to kind of determine what's going on. Yeah. yeah. And then I assume the other side's true too, that there's probably units that were so well run, yeah. had such good culture, well, well-trained folks really knew what they were doing that you could put somebody in there that maybe didn't have some of those features and they still would be successful. Yes, yeah, if you have a strong team. I mean, they're, they're the military, I, I gave three examples, two, two military, one civilian, but I mean, yes, the units understood that. I mean, these are challenging situations. If you look at problems, there are two types of problems that I, went, that I discovered in 2003 when I went into Iraq, in the initial invasion. You have complex problems and you have complex ill structure problems. <laughs> complex problems to me as a computer. I'm sure there are many people in this building that know how to put a computer together and how it works, write code and do all those things. I, I don't understand that. But I know every time I push the A on my keyboard, A comes up on the screen. It's not <laughs> ill-structured. It's complex and it's structured. The complex ill-structured problems we found are, are, uh, are people. Uh, every time you engage somebody, you come back and engage them a second time, it's a different engagement. You push an A and you get a Z or something. Yes, <laughs> and that gets compounded when you're uh, in different cultures. And I know the Vanderbilt campus is very, a very diverse campus, but everybody to get in here had to go through a very rigorous screening process. But when you went into a, uh, a meeting with the Iraqi army, political leaders, tribal leaders, uh, just the local you know, uh, education leaders, whoever you're meeting with there in these rooms and, you're, and they're speaking Arabic, so you're going through your interpreter. It's, uh, you have to be very, these are very old structured problems that you're, and what I, what I learned there was being very conscious. I mean, you observe, you observe why you're, why you're discussing to see reactions of people in a different culture. So it was really interesting uh, and, and uh, very eye opening for me on how to do uh, for leadership and bring those skills back to, back here to the United States. I guess as an academic, I, I can imagine it's interesting on one level, but then it's life and death on another. So it, it is. Yeah. <laughs> you can't just uh, study it, right? Right. Oh, no, it is. And, uh, and every, every action you have has second third order effects down the road. So what, when you finish these investigations, were, were there things that would surprise you in, you know, in the, say the MSF hospital bombing? I mean, was there something in the end that really surprised you or was it almost predictable that you would find these sequence of failures and well what didn't surprise me is these the soldiers of the air, airmen were trying their hardest to do the right thing so it just i'm not talking about them i'm talking about the commands above us and the same thing with the, the two helicopters collided the commands above us uh need to be more proactive in helping in these very complex situations the uh it's maybe a little controversial but the the drawdown uh, our, our military in the last 19 years is in, in working with political leaders together has set caps on the number of uh, military personnel that can be in any given country at any given time. So when you set a cap, you say there can only be 10,000 uh, military personnel in Afghanistan, example. And so now no redundancy. there's no redundancy, there's no oversight. People are working longer hours. People are working not in, they're working in other countries because they can't be there. So it's, it's very disheartening to me at times to see these, it's, the mission takes these resources. If you aren't giving us these resources, change the mission. But no, we're given a mission, but we're reducing the resources at the same time. It's, that's the issue I, I would see. That's what happened in Afghanistan. It's gone down so much that everybody was trying as hard as they can with, with uh, fewer resources than they actually had. Well, last question on this, on this subject and we'll, we'll change, but I'm curious, you mentioned technology as being yeah a failure point in some cases. Um, yeah. Was that something that you saw more and more often or was, I mean, te you know, technology has brought so much to the, to the armed services in so many ways, right? And, and of course the, the armed services have in many ways been the inventors of many of the technologies we, 
we benefit from today and all over the place, right? Uh, yeah, no, the, uh, the technologies are amazing. I mean, from the, the UAVs using satellites, cyber, all those pieces uh, is, is amazing. Uh, that night, it was uh, computers and communication that failed. The ability to, uh, to upload computers, because this is all on a secure system. This is not open internet, obviously. And so the connection from the ground to the aircraft and providing the data link failed that night. And so the data on the aircraft was not uh, correct. And so that's what happened that night. Uh, but the military, the technology of the military is amazing. Uh, and you're right, much of it uh, was driven by the military and the government, clearly through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But I would tell you today, the, uh, the military is, is leveraging every uh, major, uh, even the small startups, take that technology and apply it to uh, the defense of our nation. And mm. so it's, it's flipped. It's not the government pushing the technology, as you know, sir. It's, it's bringing a lot. Bring, it's bringing more from the uh, civilian yeah. world's coming into the military versus yeah. the government driving. Which is good and bad, I understand, from my friends at DISA, right? You yeah, know it is. it's very difficult. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. It's hard to hard to protect that. Yeah. Once once it comes over the uh, into the government side yeah. of the houses, it's very hard to protect at times. Yeah. Well, let's change the subject and talk yeah. a little bit about change, because uh, certainly uh, along your career, you had to do a lot of change management. Yeah. Um, and I think every organization struggles with that. Doesn't matter uh, what business you're in, uh, everyone's working through difficult changes. When I think this year's been a case study in change management. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what strategies have you learned along the way? Well, I, I, can, I can tell you three examples. I think you have to apply the strategy, obviously, to the situation. But uh, one, one, one organization I joined was having uh, problems. Uh, you know, they were a good quality professional organization, but we needed to change the, the, the uh, organization. There's about 4,000 soldiers, but you could put arms around it. You could isolate it off and change the organization the way you wanted to, the team could. And so what we, how we did it, we did three, three things we focused on. We focused on the vision. We, got, we figured out the vision of our organization. We got buy-in across the uh, organization. Everybody understand, okay, we understand this vision. It's simple to the point. And we use the vision to drive decision making. If someone brought a decision to me, uh, asked me for a decision, and it had nothing to do with the vision, then I said, we're, we're wasting our resources on this decision. Why are we deciding this? Because it has nothing to do with what the unit does. And then we, uh, so division, and then the next thing you need is trust. Trust to be trained and fit mentally and physically. And so we, we built trust in the organization that everybody was physically fit. Uh, it, it's a civilian organization you're talking about. You know, can you physically do your job? But, do you get enough sleep the night before? When you come to work, are you ready to go? And then mentally fit. Are you mentally challenging yourself to understand the mission, your job, your profession? And then we got trust in that everybody took that on themselves. But the one, no, the world's not perfect. Not everybody <laughs> does that. And so you wanted peers. You want peers to police each other. If you're, if you're getting peers saying, hey, you, you came to work today, you weren't ready, or you, your physical fitness is not ready, or you didn't look like you didn't get enough sleep last night, what you're... You're degrading our performance today because you didn't take care of yourself last night. If you got peers doing that, then you're, you're doing fantastic. And then we, and then the third one is power leaders to make decisions at the appropriate level. And if you can do that, then you, now people will get more buy-in to the vision, and then more understanding of the vision, more trust, more empowered leaders. And if you can get that sp uh, spiraling upward, it is an amazing feat to watch an organization that's powering kind of a up. virtuous uh, it just, cycle. They, they feed on each other. It, it, more empowered leaders means more better, uh, better understanding of the vision, better trust. It just keeps going up. The second one I'm going to give is uh, I did have an opportunity to work with Joe Petraeus several times. So I'm going to kind of paraphrase one of his. Uh, Benish, this, this is where you, you don't control. You can't put your arms around. And his, and, and I've tried this with organizations when I became a general officer, is you get, you get the big ideas right. But he was big on this. How do, you, how do you change Iraq in 2007 to a civil war to some semblance of security? And he said, get the big ideas right. And then you have to communicate the big ideas. Uh, for him, it was Congress, the president, it was uh, every soldier. And then you, you have an assessment plan, your measurement plan to see if it's been implemented correctly. And then you refine the, refine the big ideas. You know, just because you came up with them doesn't mean they're, they're not going to change over time. And if you do that, then you can change a large, very complex situation, like in Iraq in 2007. Uh, I'll tell you the last one, and this is more of a personal one. Um, this is when you can change, change a place and you have a lot of time. And I'm going I'm to use my father. I, I, I told you he was a banker. 
a community bank in uh, Columbia, Tennessee. Over time, he, not him by himself, the community, with the governor's help and many other people, they, they transformed uh, Murray County and the surrounding counties. I mean, they built, they have a great community college there that provides, you know, quality uh, education to young people who want to work in the local area. They built a regional hospital. They, they set across land that could be used for industry. They, they worked on the, uh, the infrastructure uh, it's close to the interstates to build other interstates. I mean, they worked, the, whole, the whole team did, but he had a big part in this. And when you build it, then they will come. And so, you know, Saturn initially came, of course Saturn's gone, but GM just, just made a commitment to put $2 billion into an uh, automobile plant in, in Burry County to, make, to build electrical cars. So this plant's going to be along for a long time. And there's a lot of other industry coming in. Now, a lot of this building off Nashville, I'm, I'm realistic, but, but over time they built this, you know, this area that really was welcoming to other people and uh, changed it, I think, for the better for the, the for people in Middle Tennessee. That's great. Yeah. I have to do a little advertisement for Columbia, too. For When spring rolls around, they have the most amazing thing called Mule Day. Hopefully it'll happen this year. It was canceled last spring. But uh, if you've never seen large numbers of mules in your life, you got to go to Mule Day. It's uh, I'm not. I'm not kidding. It's it is, it is a, a spectacle is. among yeah. you would you know you'll remember it the rest of your life. Let's yeah. put. It. It's kind of like going to a bullfight or something in Spain. You know, yeah. it's like it is a it is a lot of fun. Right. And uh, and of course, while you're down there, you can go to President Polk's house, which right. is in Columbia too. So right. lots of lots of fun outings down in that uh, area. But you know, this question about change uh, came in from oh, he's one of our Marine students, Graner, and of course he has a little zinger in there because he also asked, how did you handle culturally unpopular decisions? Yeah. Well, the biggest thing is to be transparent. As we work through a problem set, and uh, we're hitting, we're, this is good, we're hitting crises, we're hitting problems that we, we face, not the, the easy stuff. Uh, one of the biggest issues, that the, a big problem the Army has is sexual assault. I'll be up front with you. So as you implement these programs, uh, you need to really have transparency and really understand your values of, and dignity and respect for everybody. And you, as you, and if you have transparency, everybody can see in what's going on. Then you can really change a organization when it comes to dignity and respect, and uh, with sexual assault being one of the main problems we have. The other thing you, uh, you do is you get your lawyers involved. <laughs> and uh, I mean that honestly. Uh, before I made a decision about something very difficult. I always had a good uh, JAG officer there, the lawyer, and we would go over it and say, okay, what is the Army policy? What are the laws? Uh, how is this going to be uh, interpreted by others? And we would go over it, and uh, he would give, he'd provide me advice, but, I, but again, the commander makes the decision how you go forward here. And if you do that, so that make sure you stay within the, uh, what the Army expects a commander to do, but then remain transparent, uh, you, can you can take on the hard issues. That's great. Uh, good, good advice for any any manager. Doesn't matter what. I would, I would think in your business, it would, a larger business has their own uh, yep. in-house lawyers. Yep. You would yep. always talk to them. Yep. yep. Well, Joe Love, uh, he's a, a fellow from the Army, and uh, he he gets curious about how your time at Owen, your MBA, you know, made a difference for you yeah. in your military career. When I came here, the first seven years, we kind of went over. I was in the Army. I was just at the junior levels, and I was surrounded. It was all army. There was nothing else. When I, it really took me out of my comfort zone, which I, I think everybody, the, the military personnel here is great. And you get to put in a different culture uh, and you wear civilian clothes for two years, which is fantastic. And you really <laughs> just delve, delve into other problems. And so I thought that was huge. So when I went back, I was uh, accustomed to not just working at the army solution, but th there are other ways using diversity of ideas, diversity of experience, diversity of people to look at other ways of problem solving. And so that was the biggest thing I learned there. And um, you bring a team of diverse people together to solve a problem. And so I took that back with me back in the Army. It's not just all about the Army. It's about getting different ideas together. And are there things you think you would learn here that you wouldn't have learned in the Army? I, I think that's the number one. Uh, yeah. When I, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, in, in Iraq in 2007 and eight, we had, there was a huge displaced persons uh, problem. I mean, people were forced out of their homes because of security. And so. We felt like by 2008 we could solve that problem. But of course the U.S. military couldn't solve the problem. Uh, but we got the U United Nations High Commission on Refugees, the United Nations to work with us. Uh, we, of course, the, the, in the end, the uh, Iraqi Baghdad 
uh, city council had to do the work. But the Iraqi army, uh, ourselves, other NGOs, we all worked together to really try to encourage people to go back home and figure out where their home was and have a little bit, because the security was much better stability. And so I, I felt, I think that's what um, I got out of this experience was the, the ability to actually kind of work with different groups and be accepting of those different groups. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, in that role in Iraq, at, at times you were helping small companies get going again, yeah, build we, businesses and, we, we and jumpstart the local economy. We did, we had, uh, we did micro grants. Uh, these are about three to $500 at that time, three to $500, a lot of money in, uh, in Baghdad. And you could give a store owner three or five hundred dollars. You get the store could buy the basic uh, items for his stores, to stock the shelves, and then if, as he sold, he could, re he could buy again. So you could get the markets going again that had all been uh, looted or destroyed during the war. They could rebuild the communities, and if you get the markets together, it was amazing uh, to go down these streets by the summer of two thousand eight. Then the ice cream stores opened, and then you see families on the streets at eight o'clock at night. Uh, enjoying, you know, what they want, you know, taking care of their families, enjoying being outside, where you could not have done that earlier in the in the conflict, and so you, so that's what the stores do. The the, the social environment starts again. We also use uh, NGOs, non-government organizations. We didn't do it all ourselves because we didn't want to, and most of the NGOs, these non-government organizations, were actually Iraqis that we they were vetted, and we give them small amounts of money, and then they would go. One of them uh, set up a so, a sewing school. In a building, and they would bring in the, the uh, in this case, the Iraqi women would come, but they would teach them how to how to sew and, and make clothes, uh, you know, for the younger generation. It, the, through these wars, it lost, you know, this this part gets lost when you have the conflict, you know, the, the basic things that were passed down from the generations. And that's that's one example. We ran a computer camp for the uh, <laughs> kids. You know, we looked around and said, okay, it's summertime, there's no school, so we got an NGO and ourselves. We set up this computer camp. And we, have, we we got one of the schools. It was kind of neat to walk around and see this, but to to encourage to get the uh, get back that going again. That's fun entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Well, um, you know, what, one of the questions that came in is, you know, what should businesses be looking for when they're hiring veterans? The veterans are uh, are going to bring leadership skills though, and and their values and their selfless service with them. I think the biggest issue we have with our veterans being hired today is uh, a lot of them come out and they really don't understand what they want to do. You know, they they boot around different jobs, they accepted the job, and they've given themselves to that that position, that responsibility, for two or three years, and they go to another position. So, we on our side need to do better in uh, uh, helping our soldiers as they transition out to understand what they want to do in the future. And then our employers, uh, I actually talked to a uh, one of the healthcare companies today, their veterans event, and this question was asked in a different way: How, how do they how do they recruit uh, veterans and transitioning uh, service members? And I, I told them the, the what I would ask them questions is um, give them a problem, and then say you're the follower on this team. What are your action? What are you going to do to help the team succeed as the follower, as a member of the team? And then give them another problem. Say, okay, now you're the you're the leader of this team. And you have these five or six people of diverse experiences together. What are the actions you're going to take to help solve this, lead the team to solve this problem? And that's how I would I would encourage our uh, businesses how they how they re recruit, how they would interview someone from the military. Because the big the issue of the military is they're they're not used to using the word I. And so uh, it's all about the team. So you'll ask the, ask the sergeant what he did. Well, I was on a team that did this, and a a business. Uh, a business wants to know what are you going to bring to our team. Yeah. There's, and as I told the healthcare company, I said I understand. There's probably no I in the team. Once you're on your team, but you want to know what I'm going to bring to your team if you hire me. Is the way to look at it. So it's, it's interesting. That's great. Yeah. Well, Craig Cuphall, he asks a tough question. He, he's he's curious about what you think that some of the biggest uh, threats to civilian military relations uh, today, and and what would you do to to address it? You know, the U.S. military, uh, when they took the polls, is one of the most respected uh, institutions in the U.S., uh, much better than Congress. But um, the U.S. military has to protect our relationship with the U.S., with the American people, because our soldiers are young Americans. You know, men and women come from the American people. So the biggest concern I have are two things with this. Um, 
is that the we do not become the military and our veterans don't become uh, too open or too um, dependent on the government. If that makes sense, we don't want to look like we're we deserve all these big benefits. Uh, many of our veterans too, don't get me wrong, but we don't we don't need to have the appearance that we're uh, we're taking more than we deserve. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the other one is uh, the one that really concerns me the most in the last uh, year is I, I tr truly do believe senior leaders in the military uh, should should stay apolitical uh, unless they're going to uh, actively participate. You know, if they want to, if somebody wants to run for Congress, that's fantastic. If they want to serve as the in the uh, Department of Defense as a uh, political appointee or as just a, uh, a government employee, I think that's fantastic. But if you're sitting at your home, I think you are. You're, you should remain apolitical. Our, our nation is too divided today where you have these large numbers of general officers on one side say, I support this side, and another very large number on the other side, they were both sides this time, say, I support this side. I think that does nothing to uh, assist our nation in coming together. And so I'm concerned that when they do that, they're now dividing our military up as our nation is, and our military needs to stay focused on the American people as a whole. Challenging times in that regard. It is. <laughs> And, uh, and I think we can make our way through this. I think yeah. our nation can, but the, the military's mission is not to uh, divide itself also. Yeah. We have to stay as a united force for the nation. Well, I've got lots more questions, but I want to also put it out to all of you and questions that might come in over Zoom. Um, anything you want me to uh, read from Zoom? or I'll, I'll, I've got a couple more here, right? That, uh, but I want to make sure we're getting any questions that are coming in as we go. Feel free to drop them in. But, you know, uh, one of the questions that we had come in beforehand was about leadership at the strategic level versus kind of tactical or operational yeah. level and kind of how you think about that and the skills and attributes that you need to develop to kind of move levels. Yeah. You know, there, there are textbook answers about tactical, operational, strategic level. I, and I thought about this question many times look at it in very simple terms. The tactical leader is looking down. The tactical leader is a small group leader, whether it's in a business or in the military. The tactical leader knows the names of every person on their team. They, they should know about their family and their needs and their desires and their training needs or whatever. They're looking down and solving problems. The operational leader is in the middle and they're also, they're spending more of their time looking to their flanks, their peers, their organizations left and right. And they're focused on solving their higher headquarters. They're focused on solving the strategic leaders' uh, problems, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So looking to their, so if you're in a business and you're the marketing, the accounting, the uh, engineering team, whatever, you know, they're working all together trying to solve the, the board and the, the president's problems for them because they have all the resources. And the strategic leader is looking outside the organization. In the military, that's the strategic leaders are looking uh, their, their, their responsibilities to Congress, inform the Congress. Uh, they're actually looking through the media, they're presenting the message of the military and the, their mission. They're looking at their allies. They have to work a lot with their allies, our allied, our allied na national political leaders and allied uh, military leaders to make sure they remain committed to the uh, U.S. mission. And then they're working with the, uh, the other services also in the joint community. So they're really looking out in, in many different directions. That's why they need the operational leaders to help solve their problems. And there's different skill sets it takes to be able to lead at those different levels. And if you're thinking in your own career, you want to move into those other levels, what are the kinds of things you need to do in developing skills? Well, you need to, you know, there's the formal education piece that the military has. I mean, when you're a colonel, you're allowed, you're uh, selected uh, to go through a selection process to get another master's. So I was able to go to the Naval War College and get a master's in uh, international studies, and then, but then you want to get the, you get those you get selected to be in certain positions. So uh, myself, I was selected to work at uh, Central Command. Uh, Central Command is responsible for the Middle East, and uh, I worked for General Petraeus four different times. So you you're part of the team. I mean, he's the lead, obviously leading it. You're part of this uh, small team that's uh, looking out in those many different directions. And so then when it's your turn. Uh, my mission when I was in Kuwait, I was the uh, four deployed two star there. And uh, so I spent a lot of time meeting with our allied military leaders, some of the uh, US ambassadors in the different countries, 
and then uh, to really shape the uh, Middle East uh, in accordance with the, the U.S. national interest, but really the U.S. military interest was my piece of that. So you get those jobs as you go along until you're moving them yourself. Yeah. I, I, this one's a more personal one, so I'm kind of curious, and you can decide whether you want to address it or not. But what lessons do you think a university like Vanderbilt could learn from the military? I mean, right now, of course, in the middle of COVID, we're you know we're looking to the military in lots of ways. I think because yeah. we're trying to learn to do things that we weren't particularly good at, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but but even in more in general, I think there's there's things that we could learn. I'll tell you the lesson I think the military learned in 2003, and I think we got better at it, and I'm not sure how the university does. Uh, we've become much more, much more agile, flexible, uh, much more uh, open to ambiguity. I mean, and now in our jobs, I search for ambiguity. And we want ambiguity allows opportunities. If everything is straight lines, this is the way we're going to do it the next, this next semester, then there's no, uh, there are no opportunities out there. But if you're in a, an environment that is very a little bit confusing and complex, then you can search out for opportunities. So the, the military's got very good at that because we were forced to. Mm -hmm. When we got into Iraq and Afghanistan, these are very uh, confusing environments, and so you had to look for where the opportunities were. Now, I tell you, the other one uh, that I think the military's done better, and it's a little bit harder for me to, to explain, but um, looking how you link seemingly disparate actions uh, together to get to a, a desired end state. And so uh, let me give you a, a very blunt example. So healthcare in Afghanistan, uh, you know, prior to September 11th, 2001, uh, the U.S. military didn't really have a say in healthcare in Afghanistan. We didn't, you know, that wasn't our job. Uh, after 2001, well, we cared about healthcare in Afghanistan, but it wasn't so much we cared about healthcare in Afghanistan. We wanted the Iraq the Afghan military to be able to provide uh, security enough so the local people could have health care. We wanted the Afghan district councils, the political leaders, to be able to organize themselves so they could provide health care. So we use health care to drive other objectives, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I think that's uh, some of the things, what, what you're doing, the ON Forward this week? I yep. think, okay, so I've listened to one, I'm on the one for Friday. I mean, I think these are great ways to kind of bring people together. And, and when when you're forced, not when you can't be in person, yeah. there are actually advantages to that. You can you can reach out across the United States to get people to Owen, whether it's just a Zoom call for uh, for an hour, listening to a, you know, I, I listened to the new Entrepreneurial Center uh, sure. presentation this week, and that was sure. that was fantastic to yeah. to understand what was going on. And it's limited now where it was, but what it'll be back when you get back in person. Yeah. No, it's created a lot of great opportunities yeah. and so forth. But I do think, uh, yeah, we have a question. Yeah, so uh, Mark Smikowski, who's another active duty Army officer, he wanted to know um, what's one piece of advice you would give to the active duty officers going back, and really is there anything that you feel like we should uh, like capitalize on being here at home before we go back? Yeah. Well, I would uh, recommend uh, this, this, take advantage of all the other the out, outside the classroom activities. What I've read about from uh, these clubs or to build a, do these competitions to put yourself in the arena outside your comfort zone. And so take advantage of every one of you can. Um, I, I, that's, that's, so that's something that's changed a lot since I was here. I mean, there's, there's so many more other opportunities here. And then I would say the, 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 the more important of that, though, is the networking. How, how to network with uh, not just your fellow students, which you better do and, and better keep up with over the next You're a captain. Someday you're getting out, okay? <laughs> and you need to figure it out, and you need to call these network people to help you when you get out. But but you can also help them while they're out. So I don't, I don't mean you're you're doing it you're doing it for great reasons to help each other over the next several years, but also when you get out. And then, um, but not just them. It's the business leaders. I know you have a lot of business uh, the senior leaders, CEOs, and things like that coming here. I mean, the more you can just introduce yourself and and learn from them, uh, and then you can take these ideas with you back to your organization and question: Are we doing the right things right now? Uh, you, you'd be surprised. Most of the military officers actually read a lot of business books. I didn't read just in here, but I've got a shelf full, uh, you know, a whole library full of just, because the leadership is very similar. Sure. I mean, there, there's no, there's no market differences. I mean, the leadership is leadership. The principles are the same. But it's, it's, it's certainly one of the things that we have been thinking about a lot, you know, this fall. Um, you know, I think universities are good with ambiguity. I think we do a, a good job of, of living with the ambiguity. And sometimes we drive our students completely crazy with that, right? Because they just, 
tell me the right answer. And you know, you know, particularly at Owen, right? A lot of the, a lot of the class dis is discussion and and looking at problems from lots of different angles. And there isn't always just one right answer. There might be, you know, ten ways to get to the to the solution or whatever. And so we're we're good at that. Um, but you know, I think you think back. At, uh, you know, if I were in the 1940s, I'd be helping to you know get 18 year olds ready to storm Normandy. Yeah. You know, uh, today we're really trying to get 18 year olds to wear a mask. You know, right. and, and uh, th these are the things that sometimes universities aren't so good at. It's a little, we're a little harder to get everybody to wear the mask. You know, or or uh, you know follow the you know the, the the arrow on the floor. That's not you know that's just not what universities typically do, right? Uh, right. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, I think we've been uh, all fall, a lot of the leadership team here uh, doing, doing some good old fashioned military planning, red team, blue teams, yeah. and trying to, you know, uh, think about uh, things in a much more structured way than, than we might normally do in any academic year. Right. And I think the challenge is, as we were talking, sir, and I thought some of the students is keeping the academic experience at the highest level possible yeah. when you're having to do remote classes and things. Uh, you, you can try as hard as you can. I don't. I don't know if it's quite. Uh, I won't judge, but it doesn't seem like it's quite as high as, it, as in, in person. I know the most learning I got was with my either friends and or just the projects. The project we were going on because we mix up it. You let me different people is, is in the hallways and the desk here, and you know late on Saturday or Sunday night in somebody's apartment near uh, you know within a half a mile here and trying to figure out what the what the problem is and try to come up with a uh, quality solution. And that's where you learn so much, and then, and then you then you present it in your class and, yeah. and get quality uh, instruction back. But the, the interaction was huge. It's huge, and you know I think something we pride ourselves a lot here is that collaboration, that team spirit, that, yeah. that kind of person to person. I call it personal scale, but well, you know, that person to person learning that goes on every day. Well, that is what I learned here. Yeah. Well, General, we are first so grateful for your service. Thirty six years. Wow. It's a lot and um, a huge, huge service to our country. And we're grateful, grateful that you're here on Veterans Day because uh, we're grateful for the vets across our program. And they bring a lot to the school, as you would expect, right, um, uh, in so many ways. And uh, we're grateful for them and their service. So thank you and uh, happy Veterans Day. Thank you.